very gratified to see all of you uh, come out tonight. I introduce myself. I'm Stephen Weiss. I'm the Chief uh, Marketing Officer for JFK Health. Um, and I usually do these introductions. So it is really my pleasure to introduce, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, each speaker before they speak, so instead of, instead of doing it all at once. But it really is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who's uh, Dr. Philip Kramer, who's the director of the JFK Vestibular Laboratory. It's this gentleman right here. Dr. Kramer attended Syracuse University, which I have to give him applause for because I did as well. So I like him already. Uh, Dr. Kramer uh, attended Syracuse on an Air Force ROTC scholarship and received a bachelor degree in aerospace engineering in 1977. He then flew the B-52 in the Air Force and while there earned a bachelor's degree in computer science. After leaving the Air Force, he picked up pre-med credits at Yale prior to attending medical school at the University of Connecticut. So he's not very well educated. I'm sorry. Dr. Kramer's neurology residency was at the University of Massachusetts, followed by a fellowship in otoneurology, which is the study of dizziness, at Johns Hopkins. In 1995, he joined our uh, faculty, he joined the faculty of Johns Hopkins in the Department of Neurology and the Department of Otolaryngology, where he saw patients who were dizzy. There, he conducted basic science research on ballast uh, systems, publishing 20 papers during his career and numerous book chapters on dizziness. He has received three NIH grants for research in the field of dizziness. Dr. Kramer joined our faculty 19 years ago and is currently an associate professor at both Seton Hall and Robert Wood Johnson. He's been married to Lori for 26 years and shares his home with two adorable beagles. Everyone, welcome Dr. Kramer. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, clearly, Syracuse improved after I left. Uh, good job. Um, while I'm up here, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, it's very gratifying to see uh, this many members of the public uh, interested. Uh, and I hope you'll learn something today um, that will help you. Um, I'd also like to thank Elam Shaw uh, for helping to arrange this, along with uh, Stephen. Um, and then uh, helping throughout are, are Tracy, Josephine, and Giovanni. Um, uh, we couldn't do it without them. So let's get to the show. Uh, we're going to talk about the dizzy patient. Um, when I think of dizziness, I usually think of vertigo, which is spinning. Um, but uh, we're going to get into that a little bit more. So an overview of what I'm going to say. First, I'm going to talk about history. And what I mean by history, not the history of dizziness, I mean the patient's history, what the problem is, when it started, how it started. Um, I'm going to talk about the anatomy and physiology that explains dizziness. And through that, I'm going to talk about this thing called nystagmus, um, uh, which is one of the primary signs that I see when I'm examining a patient to help determine their problem. I'll discuss nystagmus by discussing this thing called the vestibular ocular reflex, and I'll discuss a little bit about brain processing. And finally, we'll get on to a few of the diseases that cause dizziness. Um, so history, very important thing when you come in, we'll be asking you, and, and Jigna will be doing uh, the first part of your visit if you were to come to see us. Uh, but when you see any doctor, you need to be able to explain as best you can what you mean by dizziness. Because if you got that wrong, then you're probably not going to be able to help the patient. So vertigo, and the little asterisk is because that's, that's the dizziness that a lot of my talk's going to be about, is a false sense of motion, usually rotation. Disequilibrium is really just a fancy word for being off balance. Lightheadedness. Uh, which doctors will refer to as near syncope, suggests a cardiac, a metabolic, or a drug uh, problem, as in your drug side effect is causing a problem. And then the other type of dizziness is this funny-headed, difficult to describe, floaty feeling like my head is in a different part of the room, feeling I've, every time I think I've heard it described uh, in all the ways it could possibly be described, the patient comes up uh, with another one. Um, and if that's your dizziness, then that's what we want to know. But 
that's kind of because it is somewhat vague, it's a little bit harder to diagnose. So if you can tell the doctor what you mean by dizzy, what dizzy feels to you without using the word dizzy, that's gonna be help, very helpful. The next thing that you should know is when you get dizziness, how long does the dizziness last? I'm gonna talk about a little bit about that later and Jigna is certainly gonna spend some time about that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the science behind uh, dizziness. Well, here is my uh, neuroanatomy um, of uh, the balance system. And I have one of my residents uh, in back and don't think you're gonna get away with this simplified version. You need to know it in a little more detail, but this is basically what it's all about. Um, in the middle, if, uh, hopefully you can see that dot, uh, you have a computer. That computer's the brain. It talks back and forth with another part of the brain called the cerebellum. And together, they take all these inputs, vision, the input from your inner ear, and the feeling in your feet. It takes that, they do some computations on that, and they use that to control your eye muscles. I'm gonna get into that. And that's really important to me when I examine a patient. Uh, and it's important to you because it helps stabilize your vision. But also, these downward pathways uh, that it uses to help maintain your balance. Okay, so when I examine you, I'm going to be looking for something called nystagmus. And rather than trying to um, describe nystagmus, I'm going to show you nystagmus. I'm not getting casual. I'm gonna show you a different form of nystagmus than I was planning to show you. If you can get that working, that would be great. So nystagmus is a back and forth motion of your eyes, usually going quickly in one direction and moving slowly uh, in the opposite direction. Um, I'm gonna to explain to you why that's important, but let me walk around the room and show you nystagmus. So I'm going to show you a normal nystagmus. Fortunately, I wore a tie with stripes on it, and that, that's the key to this. So what I'm gonna be doing is concentrating on the stripes as they go by, and I want you to look at my, I can, I'm gonna to have to wear my glasses. <laughs> I am want you to look at my eyes as I'm doing that. And hopefully what they're doing is they're wiggling back and forth as I do that. So I'm gonna take a minute here to show you that. A guy named Mach, the same guy who invented Mach numbers back in the 1800s, discovered this while sitting uh, by the train and watching people look at the train go by and he saw their eyes going back and forth as, uh, as he did that. And um, he was the one who discovered, this is called optokinetic nystagmus. Here I'm shaking someone's head. That isn't really nystagmus you're seeing there. You're gonna see it afterwards. And he's wearing the goggles that we use with the patients. And you notice that the eyes are moving rapidly in one direction and slowly in the opposite direction. So that's, that's nystagmus, and I, I look for that when I examine patients. Um, uh, and I'm, gonna tell, I'm about to show you why. Okay, so there's this thing called the vestibular ocular reflex. Uh, I spent uh, much of my career at Hopkins studying the vestibular ocular reflex. And it is a reflex that keeps our point, eyes pointed uh, in the correct direction to stabilize our vision. So if I'm looking at those gentlemen with the cameras, if I'm looking at one of those cameras and I move my head back and forth, I have to move my eyes in the opposite direction in order to um, be able to keep my vision pointed at that camera. That actually even happens in the dark. If we turned out all the lights and I pretend to look at the camera and move my eyes back and forth, it isn't vision that's bringing back my eyes back and forth, it's my inner ear that's bringing it back and forth. And we can demonstrate that, you can all demonstrate that now, um, unless you have a problem with your vestibular ocular reflex, by taking the piece of paper that you may have gotten here and hold it in front of you. And you can take that piece of paper and go back and forth and note, you'll note that it's difficult to read. If you hold it still, you can read it easily. But if you go back and forth, it's more difficult to read. 
Now, if your vestibular ocular reflex is working, and I suspect maybe with some of you it's not, if you hold that piece of paper out and shake your head back and forth, you should be able to read the paper much better with, with the paper still but your head going back and forth. And that's because your inner ear muscles, uh, I mean your eye muscles, are getting a message from your inner ear and stabilizing your vision. So how does the vestibular ocular reflex work? It works because the activity in the inner ear increases when the head is turned towards that um, ear. So when I start moving my head towards this ear, the nerve activity in that ear, not the hearing part, but the balance part, increases as I move towards that ear and decreases as I move away from that ear. So as I move in this direction, I'm moving towards this ear, it increases. And I, when I move towards this ear, it increases in that direction, but it decreases as I move away. So that neuroactivity is sent to your eye muscles to help move your eyes. And let's see how. Uh, even when I'm not moving, my ears are firing. My ears are putting out a signal. That becomes important in, in another second. You'll see why. So the brain interprets any imbalance in the activity between the two ears as head rotation. So as I'm moving my head this way, there's more activity on this side, less activity on that side. My head knows that I'm moving my head. Uh, my, my brain knows I'm moving my head in that uh, direction. So let's look at that. This little dot in the middle is the brain, and these lodges on either side are the nerve cells. And you'll notice that here the, the head isn't moving at all, and you have the nerves are just sitting there firing at this base rate. We'll call it five times a second. So the brain looks at that and says five minus five, that's zero. We must not be turning. In this next example, farther down, we notice that there's a bunch of spikes underneath this side and, not, and fewer under this side. So the head is rotating in this direction. What the brain does is it takes nine minus three and it gets six. So that's six, that's not zero. So we must be, and it's unfortunate you can't see this arrow well, we must be turning in this direction. The opposite happens when we go in the opposite direction. We get only three spikes on this side. So three minus nine is minus six. So we are also turning and moving in the opposite direction. When we sense that head rotation, we get the eyes moving in the opposite direction. And that's the beginning of nystagmus. So the brain interprets any imbalance in activity as head rotation. What I showed you before was normal, just someone moving their head back and forth. But now we're going to look at when there's a disease or a simulation of a disease, when there's a problem. So here in all of these, notice there's only five marks under each ear. So that tells you since it's five on one side, five on the other, the head isn't rotating in any of these examples. And that's what happens here in the first one, five minus five is zero. But notice here this X. What I've done in this, this little cartoon here is I've taken a knife figuratively, and I've cut the nerve between the ear and the brain. So now that information isn't getting from the ear to the brain. So the brain sees this side as zero. But remember, when you're not rotating, when you're not turning at all, there is some base firing rate here. So it sees nothing over here, but five over here. So it says zero minus five is minus five. So even though we're not turning, the brain thinks the head is turning. And if it thinks the head is turning, it moves the eyes in the opposite direction and you get that nystagmus. You also get the feeling like you are turning. And then we go down to the other side, uh, or the last example, when we cut the, the nerve on the other side and you get the sense of rotation in the opposite direction and nystagmus in the opposite direction. So now by looking at the direction of the nystagmus, remember first I, when we looked at that uh, at the video, when we finally got it working, we saw that the eyes were going quickly in one direction and slowly in the opposite direction. So the, um, that could tell me which side the problem is on. So that's, that's the basic simplified, you know, first thing you learn when you, when, you, when you do your fellowship in dizziness. That's the beginning of what you learn about nystagmus. It does become more complicated. It's not left just left and right. 
It can be up and down. And it can also be, if you turn your head like this, believe it or not, your eyes turn in your head like this. It's called torsion. So when you get a mixture of those different things, it can mean all kinds of different things. And it, it can not only be your ear that causes the problem, but sometimes it's the brain that causes your problem. So that's what I spent the time at Hopkins studying is uh, part of what I sp did was learning how to recognize various nystagmus and, and know what that means. And every once in a while, I come up with a, one that I haven't seen before. It isn't published in the books and it, you just have to kind of think out what it means. Okay, so remember I said in the history, not only do I want to know what you mean by dizziness, I want to know, especially if you have vertigo, vertigo is spinning. By the way, if you've been to a doctor and they've told you, and you've told them you had dizziness, and they said, oh, you have vertigo, they're, they're, they're misleading you. Vertigo is a symptom. Vertigo is the sense of spinning. It's the same thing as going to a doctor and saying, doctor, my foot hurts, and they say, oh, you have pain. So if they tell you a vertigo, you need to ask them, what, what's causing the vertigo? Why do I have vertigo? If you've told them you have spinning, you know yourself you have vertigo. So if you have vertigo and it lasts a certain amount of time, that's very, very helpful in telling me or any other doctor what the problem is. So here we have a list of, of diseases and you can ignore this column and you can ignore this column. The bottom message is this last column. How long does it last? And you notice there's not much overlap here. Hours, hours between Meniere's and migraine, and I'm gonna talk about that later, but each of these has a different amount of time that they last. Lasting less than a minute, lasting a few minutes, lasting hours. So with that, it, that's one of the biggest clues as to telling what the problem is and telling it apart. So when you go to the doctor, you should already have in your mind, what do you mean, or how long does the dizziness last? And Jigna's gonna tell you more about that. Okay, so let's start talking about various diseases. Uh, until recently, the most commonly diagnosed disease is something called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And what I mean by disease, di diseases that cause dizziness, diseases that cause spinning. Benign paroxysmal, uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, you may know that as the crystals, the loose crystals in your inner ear. Um, this is our fancy name for it. And the, what's caused by is introduction of crystals, which are really called onychonia, into the semicircular canals, into these tubes, these hollow tubes. When the crystals get into these hollow tubes, they interfere with how the, the tubes work and head movements with respect to gravity cause the crystals to move around in there and cause the, um, the inner ear to send a false signal to the brain. So let me show that. This is, this is an inner ear. This is one, uh, uh, one of the semicircular canals. And this is with a patient laying on their back. And this little blue dot represents the crystals sitting there all clumped together. So when the patient sits up, going over to this diagram on your right, that, that blue dot moves down from here to here. Well, there's fluid inside this inner ear tube, and that pushes, the, when the crystals move, it pushes the fluid, it pushes against this thing called the cupula, and that changes that firing rate of the inner ear, so it changes the signal it sends to the brain. So falling debris, which are the crystals, pushes fluid in front of it, thus deforming the cupula and changing the signal it sends to the inner ear. So how do we diagnose BPPV? The crystals. So it's a rapid onset of vertigo with head movement relative to gravity. So what do I mean by that? Things like rolling over in bed, bending over, rolling over in bed, putting your head back, rolling over in bed, getting into and out of bed, and did I mention rolling over in bed? <laughs> and the reason I say that is if you're not getting dizzy rolling over in bed, then you probably don't have this. Now, doctors have to be very careful about this because very often you'll, you'll ask a patient, and, and I'm telling you this, and it's a little bit funny, 
but it's, it should make you think about how you answer a doctor's question. A doctor may ask you, do you get dizzy rolling over in bed? And I've done this with patients and they'll say no. And I'll ask them, well, do you roll over in bed? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, why don't you roll over in bed? Because if I do, I'll get dizzy. <laughs> and it's funny, but if a doctor doesn't know to follow that question, then, then you might not get to the right answer. So think about what the doctor's looking for. Maybe think a little bit beyond what, what they're asking. Rolling over, and some patients will say, no, I don't roll over in bed. Do you turn over in bed? Oh, sure, and then I get dizzy. So you have to be a little bit careful with these questions. Um, it lasts seconds. So um, it, it will, in reality, it usually lasts 10 or 15 seconds. It can last up to 30 seconds. It can even last up to a minute. So I had this once, and my patients are always telling me it lasts two or three minutes. And I, then I do this maneuver, and I notice what they have, and I, I can make a definitive diagnosis of saying, why are they telling me two or three minutes? So when I got this once, I knew instantly what it was. Um, I had been in a car accident, and I knew that was the reason I could have it. I had little signs of it. I knew it was had. So when I got it, I said, this is great. I'm dizzy. I'm going to time how long this makes, time in my, how long this takes. I'm going to time it in my mind. So here you have someone who is educated in the science, prejudiced to how long it's going to last, paying specific attention to it. I swear to God, it lasted two minutes. <laughs> in reality, I bet it lasted 15 seconds, but it was so horrible, it seemed to last two minutes. So it can be very hard to judge, but if you can notice how long it lasts, if you have a partner, you could say it's starting now, it's stopping now, and maybe they'll look at a clock, they'll figure it out, but that's very important to us. And then on exam, we do this thing called the dix Horpike maneuver, where we lay you down, we try to bring out the dizziness, um, and um, um, we see whichever side we do that on that you get worse on, that's the likely side that you have the problem. The treatment for it is it's often, it's often self-limiting. It often will go away in a couple of weeks, but it can last years. My record is a woman who had it for 30 years. She slept, slept, she slept sitting up every night for 30 years. She came to me. I saw it. I treated her. She was great for two weeks. It came back, uh, which is a problem with this. I treated her again, and I haven't seen her since. So either I fixed her or <laughs> I don't want to say. 20% um, 20, 20 of the time, it, does, it is recurrent. And when it starts recurring, we teach you the maneuver how to fix it. Cat will teach you the maneuver how to, uh, how to fix it so you can do it yourself and not deal with these obnoxious doctors and the waiting room um, so you can treat it yourself. OK. Moving on to something called Meniere's disease. Fancy doctors call it endolymphatic high drops, but it is due to de -absor decreased absorption of that inner ear fluid I was talking about. It leads to a buildup of fluid, buildup of pressure in the inner ear, and that causes that cupula thing to displace, to lay over. It also causes leaking of the fluid, um, and from that, patients get dizzy. So here's the things we look for, and the yellow things are the really important things. They should have vertigo, a sense of spinning that starts usually over minutes. It lasts minutes to hours, and with it, they get tinnitus, a loud ringing in their ears. They can get fullness in their ears, and after they've had several attacks, Kramer's rule is they must have hearing loss on testing. They should have hearing loss on, in one ear, hearing loss in one ear as opposed to the other ear. If you don't have that, then I don't diagnose it as Meniere's disease. The treatment is a low salt diet and a diuretic. Okay, labyrinthitis or vestibular neuritis. They're almost exactly the same and often the terms are used interchangeably. Labyrinthitis is an inflammation of the inner ear. Uh, vestibular neuritis is an inflammation of the nerve to the inner ear, and it's very tricky to tell the difference between the two. They're essentially the, two, the same, and they're treated the same way. So the diagnosis is made by vertigo, nausea and vomiting. With vert it can either come on all of a sudden, it can come on stuttering, um, and it lasts days. Days. Constant spinning for days. 
I often say after two or three days, you no longer want to die. It's really a horrendous problem. Uh, it's often related to a viral infection. Herpes 1, that's the canker sore herpes, um, has been cultured out in a number of patients. They'll have nystagmus for the first couple of weeks uh, after, maybe even a little bit longer. That helps to diagnose. And then some inner ear testing, which you have, Elizabeth isn't here yet. Elizabeth will be coming later. Um, uh, she'll be talking to you about the inner ear testing that can show um, results that help us lead to the diagnosis. The treatment, part of it is just time. It just takes time to get better. During that time, um, actually kind of in the wrong order here, clonopin or meclizine are two drugs that help deaden the balance system and can, can make it a little bit more survivable, take the edge off uh, as you start to get better. Once you can tolerate it, then we send you to Kat for physical therapy, and she can get you better much faster than just uh, sitting around. But it can be those first few days can really be a, a dreadful problem. First few days, you're spinning, then you finally can get out of bed. You're walking around touching objects for the next week. After three weeks, maybe you're, you're able to go back to work. And this is, a, this is the typical case. Sometimes it's much less severe. Sometimes it's much worse. All right, TIA, transient ischemic attack. These are like what people often refer to as mini strokes, little temporary strokes, but they can cause dizziness. The problem with the TIA is it can be a warning that you're going to have a real stroke. Um, most of dizziness is relatively benign. This can be a bad warning. Um, so this is supposed to be a brainstem. I, I drew this. I'm a doctor, not an artist. I'm sure you'd agree. Um, this is the brain stem, and this is that cerebella, cerebellum thing hanging off the back. And these are all the blood vessels that, go, uh, that feed the brain stem and the cerebellum. And this middle one, the, it's abbreviated ICA, is right here, and it feeds the inner ear. This is, this is the inner ear over here on the right, and the blood supply to the, to the inner ear here. So if you lose blood supply to any of that, even temporarily, you can get spinning from uh, that. So how do we make the diagnosis? TIAs come on suddenly, just like that. They last minutes, very suspicious, two to five minutes. Now, I just told you about BPPV. It lasts less than a minute, but it feels like it's two minutes. So that's why a very precise history can be useful. It's, uh, so two to five minutes is very suspicious, but it can be up to half an hour. You look for other signs like facial numbness, loss of pain in the body, your palate being off. This is why we do a neurologic exam on you to make sure that, that uh, to look for those other things. And then we can do some imaging testing, MRIs, MRAs, um, but uh, this, is, this is the basic way that we try to find out. If you have a TIA, it's a temporary, a transient ischemic attack. And then you go to the doctor three days later, well, they're going to see a normal exam. So then it becomes, well, do you have high cholesterol? Are you in your 70s? Do you smoke? Do you have diabetes? Do you have high blood pressure? Gee, you're at risk of having a stroke. Maybe we better work that up. But uh, it can be very difficult to diagnose in the uh, afterthought. Okay. Vestibular migraine. So before I said the crystals used to be the most commonly diagnosed cause of dizziness, it has just been passed out by vestibular migraine. What are vestibular migraines? Vestibular migraines are migraines, just like any other migraine, except they don't necessarily cause headache. Doctor, how can I have a migraine without a headache? Migraines are these very complicated things. We actually don't know the pathophysiology of it that well. We're beginning to make um, some, um, uh, crossing some milestones in that, making some headway on it. But it's a very complicated thing. Maybe some of you have had or know someone who have had an ocular migraine. And this is right there. Raise your hand. No, you don't have. No, that's a HIPAA violation. Don't raise your hand. Um, an ocular migraine um, will cause 
stars or a hole in your vision or wavy lines and you never get a headache or some people never get a headache with it. That's because the migraine phenomenon is hitting back here and that disturbs your field of vision here. If the migraine phenomena hits here, this arm goes limp and, and temporarily uh, because this is the part of my brain that controls my vision, I mean my, my arm. If it hits in the back of the brain down here where I, I control my balance, then I have trouble with my balance and I can have spinning. Um, so the diagnosis um, may include loss of vestibular function, but if a patient complaint, complaints sound like migraine, except instead of them saying headache, they say dizziness, uh, then it is likely a vestibular migraine. Photophobia, light bothers their eyes. Sonophobia, loud noises by their eyes. You know, when you're dizzy, you like to lie down in a dark room and sleep it off. That really smells of vestibular migraine. If they have a past medical history or a family history of migraine, that makes it even easier to diagnose. And maybe eating chocolate, MSG, or red wine will trigger it. Okay. The thing is, the differential diagnosis of this, the uh, thing it can be easily confused with is that other thing called Meniere's disease. My most common difficult decision to make um, is in, when I see patients is whether they have migraine or Meniere's disease because both of them can cause hearing loss, both of them can cause tinnitus, and both of them can cause fullness in your ear. The treatment... Um, our various medications, these are the ones I like to use, Zoloft, an antidepressant, that's off-label. That's not FDA approved for that, but I found it very effective for treating migraine. Elevil and Topamax are FDA approved for treating regular migraine. Nothing is FDA approved for treating vestibular migraine because it's just such a hard animal to get in touch with. Uh, supplements such as magnesium, CoQ10, and vitamin B2 have been helpful. And for patients who don't want any of that, want to try something um, a little bit less invasive, uh, we uh, can teach you uh, a diet which might help prevent migraine. Okay, ototoxicity. This is when you lose function in both ears. So those, those little hair cells that were, that were having spikes underneath, you know, get none of that. The brainstem has nothing to look for to figure out whether you're spinning one way or the other. So it's a bilateral loss of vestibular function caused by drugs, antibiotics, um, such as gentamicin, vancomycin, gentamicin, um, Lasix, gentamicin. Um, you're getting my point. I've probably seen 50 of these and 48 of them were due to gentamicin. Two were due to vancomycin. Um, and um, you can also get it from an autoimmune problem. Uh, an example of autoimmune disease is something like lupus. That's when your antibodies attack yourself. But most of the time I see it, it's due to gentamicin. You diagnose it by history of exposure to something like gentamicin at the right timing that you have the loss. Um, they, they lose dynamic visual acuity. That's when they're shaking. That, the, the thing I just showed you, when they shake their head, they can't see very well. And then we can do some testing uh, that will help show us that. The treatment is, on, is prevention, not using the drug um, and knowing if anyone in your family has had a reaction to that drug because it, it can be hereditary. Um, and then again, we send them to Kat um, because uh, she's the one who can best fix them. Uh, we can't fix the ear, but she can teach you how to cope with it. Okay, my last, um, the last disease I'm going to talk about is something called a vestibular schwannoma. It used to be called an acoustic neuroma, and I often find myself uh, saying acoustic neuroma. I always wondered when my parents called their friends, their, the women, by their maiden name. It's, wow, ah, they've been married for 40 years. Why are you using the maiden name? Because that's what you learned, and that's what you do. Now I do that, and I do it with acoustic neuroma, um, or vestibular schwannoma, I call them acoustic neuroma. So anyway, it's a growth on the nerve, that inner ear nerve. It's not cancer. Um, it uses, um, it, the problem is because it can grow slowly, it can and touch the nerve and not touch the nerve, it can mimic almost any one of these diseases I've talked about. So it's really that thing out there 
that, that doctors are afraid of that they don't want to miss because it's easy to confuse with other diseases. It comes with a hearing loss on one side almost always, um, and you work it up with an MRI. Uh, if you're not treated, it can lead to bad stuff like a loss of hearing on one side. It can lead to loss of balance on that side. The nerve that controls the muscles of your face are on that side. So if it got bad enough, you could actually get paralyzed on one side of your face. And, and I, I guess if it got, if you'd really let it go, uh, it could kill you. The thing is they grow very, very slowly. So usually, you know, you're gonna catch it. Even if you make a mistake, you'll catch it by then. JFK is a center of excellence for the treatment of it. We can, we can treat it in various ways, depending how big it is. So um, I don't find them often, but when I do, um, uh, I, know, I know I've got a good place to send them. And then these are the, these are the two beagles that own me. Um, that, that is Stan, and that is Stanley, and that's Oliver, Stan and Ollie. Um, just, just worked out that way. And, uh, and when my wife and I travel, we admit to, uh, by ourselves, we admit that we don't miss each other that much, we miss them. <laughs> so that's all I had. Stephen, if, uh, do you want to do the intros or? Um, so he's going to introduce Jigna. Jigna is my nurse practitioner that, we, um, that we've taken on because I was backed up six months. We're not backed up anywhere near as far. And I just want to tell you, she's really nervous about talking. <laughs> so when she comes up, big hands. Thank you. So uh, next up is Jigna Patel, nurse practitioner at JFK Vestibular Laboratory. Uh, tell you a little about Jigna. Jigna grew up in Clarksville, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. Completed her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing at Austin Peay State University. She pursued uh, her further education at Texas Women's University and received her Master's of Science in Nursing. She is certified with the, Acad with the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners, worked in primary care, nutrition, and wellness, has recently moved to the lovely state of New Jersey from North Carolina, lives with her husband, her in-laws, and two wonderful children. Jigna? I am the nurse practitioner that works with Dr. Kramer. It has been my honor and privilege to work with him for over a year now. So upon your first initial visit, you will first be evaluated by me, whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, this is where I will obtain your history um, and perform just a basic neurological exam. Dr. Kramer will do more of an extensive exam. So what I'm going to try to teach you in the first or in the next few minutes, really, is just to help you tell us how you can give us some good information about your dizziness. So the two biggest things are, what does your dizziness feel like and the timing of it? So giving a description of your dizziness is probably one of the most difficult things to do because when you're feeling dizzy, you're not thinking about the details of it. You just want it to go away. You want it to be over. Um, so as Dr. Kramer had mentioned, we'll probably repeat some of the same descriptions here. Um, some points to really keep in mind are if you feel it is vertigo. So again, vertigo is the sense of spinning. You feel like you're spinning or the world around you is spinning. It's not a diagnosis, it is just spinning. The other descriptions we get a lot are if the dizziness is not vertigo, people often feel off balance, they feel like they're floating, is it bouncing, swaying, brain foggy, some people will say they feel like they're drunk, all kinds of descriptions, we've heard many, and when we think we've heard it all, we really haven't. Um, so again, it's, it's very important to try to determine if your dizziness is spinning or if it's a different type of sensation. So then we can help diagnose what type of dizziness you might have. Another very crucial part of the diagnosing dizziness is the timing. So timing meaning, is your dizziness episodic or is it constant? If it is episodic, then how long does just the dizziness occur? 
again, we understand it's really difficult to pay attention. As Dr. Kramer said, he thought you know he would be able to see if it's a few seconds, but it felt like it was a minutes. So knowing this, if this were to occur to you or if this is happening, um, a good suggestion would be just to try to start tracking your dizzy episodes and when it's happening, how long is it lasting? Whether if you're getting spinning or if you're getting these other type of dizzy sensations, how long is just the dizziness happening? Is it seconds, minutes, hours? That kind of thing, just to generalize in that form of time um, that will really help us to help you. And if it is constant, when did it become constant? So constant meaning that it never goes away. It might wax and wane, it varies with intensity, but you are really dizzy all the time. It never goes away, whether you're sitting or laying down. So one of the, the biggest things I think we come across is when patients do come to us, they tell us, oh, I'm just dizzy all the time. And it's just, I don't, I don't know. You know better than we know how your dizziness feels. So if you can really try to differentiate the timing of it and really just how long it's lasting, that'll, that'll just be really helpful for us. So other symptoms um, that we do ask that may come with your dizziness are nausea, vomiting, headaches and migraines, any hearing changes or tinnitus, which is ringing in your ears, if there's any vision problems, or if you've been falling. Um, these may come with or without your dizziness. And then when we do ask the timing again, we're just asking about the dizziness and not the other symptoms that you might be feeling. Um, they may, you know, they may come together or they may not come together. It just varies. So most patients that come to us have seen multiple doctors. They've sought treatment elsewhere. Um, as a part of your evaluation, it's really important that you personally bring any testing results that you may have had. This can include anything from a hearing test or an audiogram, any inner ear testing, um, which is the vestibular testing where they put hot air and cold air into your ears. That's the vestibular testing. Um, any MRIs or CAT scans of your brain you may have had or any blood work as well. So often when you ask your other providers to fax those results to us, good old you know, EMR medical system, often it doesn't get to us. So if you have those records, it's very important that you do try to bring it to us. Um, it, it really helps Dr. Kramer to look at some of those test results as we're trying to diagnose. It will just speed up the process of us trying to treat you and help you. So after um, my part of the exam is finished, uh, you then do see Dr. Kramer, and then he further evaluates your symptoms. Um, if you have your testing, he will review all that, and then he'll determine your treatment and then your follow-up visit. So the most important form that I see some of you have in your hands that we need completed prior your visit if you decide to come see us is this dizziness questionnaire. Dr. Kramer has specifically created this form to help determine the type of dizziness that you may have. So it's pretty detailed, as you can see. There's a whole checkoff list in the back. There's you know, multiple questions on the front there. But having that completed prior your visit, um, it really, really helps us narrow down the type of dizziness you have. Um, and then we can really you know, try to help you so I think between when we have a break, if you'd like to pick one up, we have a bunch up here. Um, we ask that you do take it. And then if you do decide to schedule an appointment or come see us, please bring that to your first visit. Or when they ask you to um, send back the new patient paperwork or anything like that, you, know, you can put it in that packet and we can definitely review it. Um, the other thing is it's also very important that you do find out with your insurance company if you require a referral to be seen. Um, because uh, Dr. Kramer's practice is a specialized field, some insurances do require that you have a referral. So finding that information out, getting the referral, and then making your appointment will just help speed up your process, and then we can see you sooner. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, so just make sure that before you know you decide to schedule your first visit, you have specific forms filled out, you get the information about your insurance and just the referral process. Um, again, I think you know we're very pleased with the amount of people that showed up to the seminar, um, and we look forward to very much trying to take care of many of you if you decide to come see us. Thank you. So our next speaker is Kat Ferraro, physical therapist, PT, OT, outpatient. Kat's a physical therapist who has worked at JFK for nine years in the outpatient physical therapy department. She graduated from Ithaca College with her master's degree in clinical science. Her specialty over the past six years has been vestibular rehabilitation, where she trains the new staff in all aspects of the vestibular system. She wants to make sure they are all equipped in thoroughly evaluating and treating patients with dizziness and balance disorders. She works closely with Dr. Kramer and Jigna Patel to assure the best care for shared patients. Once a week, they evaluate patients for a more comprehensive approach. Kat? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, I'm Ekaterina Ferrero, but everyone calls me Kat. Um, so, it's, so I'm a physical therapist. I work at our um, outpatient department across the street in the hospital, and I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Kramer for about five years now, uh, evaluating patients with dizziness or balance issues. Um, and I am going to give a brief overview of uh, what it is that we do in vestibular uh, physical therapy. Basically, what vestibular rehab is all about is it's um, when you come in, we do design a comprehensive program um, to treat individuals with functional limitations due to symptoms of dizziness, which can include vertigo, motion intolerance, lightheadedness, all the descriptions that um, Dr. Kramer and Jigna talked about, and balance problems. So along with symptoms of dizziness and imbalance, people can also suffer fatigue and weakness that we could also address with physical therapy. So the first day of therapy is an evaluation. So um, along with the diagnosis that we gather from the doctor, from the referring doctor, we also perform our own evaluation and examination. We look at things such as posture, range of motion, strength. We look at different balance tests. We look at coordination. We do a visual screen, which we look at the eyes, and we also look for nystagmus and things like that. Uh, we do testing for BPPV, which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. We also look at memory and some cognitive testing. So after looking at all those things, we do come up with an individualized program to work with uh, whatever you know is wrong. So there's three treatment theories that vestibular rehab relies on. Um, and I'm going to discuss them in length. Um, so basically, it's habituation, adaptation, and substitution, as well as the canalith repositioning maneuver to treat BPPV. So the first treatment theory is habituation. And basically, what that is, is we teach exercises and different movements that produce dizziness that are performed in a controlled setting and in various intensities. So basically, there's a test that we do called the motion sensitivity quotient that kind of goes through all these different positions and we see which ones make you the dizziest and then we pick a few of those out and we usually do three to five repetitions over a few weeks until they no longer produce dizziness. So yes, you are gonna get dizzy with physical therapy, but it is gonna help you, so you really have to give it a chance because you know, usually people come in and they're like, oh my God, I felt so much worse after therapy, but that is the point. We have to stimulate your vestibular system in order for it to adapt. So if you do feel that way, you know, coming from the first or second appointment, please give it a chance because you know or we know that it is going to get better, and hopefully the therapist will um, educate you on that it is going to get better. You know, it is going to be a little bit worse before it gets better, the symptoms. 
Um, the next treatment approach is called adaptation, and that is the vestibular ocular reflex. That is the main exercise that we focus on. That's what Dr. Kramer spent uh, most of the time talking about. Um, and basically, um, how he said, you look at a target or you take a piece of paper and you move your head back and forth, and that's pretty much how you do the exercise. Um, so this exercise can be done in sitting, it could be done in standing, we change the surface, we change how long you do it for, we can change the lighting, we could tailor it to whatever um, things that you have to do in your life that will make you, will help with this. The next treatment approach is called substitution, and this is um, using alternate strategies to help replace the loss of function or compromised function within your system. So this treatment approach, we do a lot of balance exercises. We um, try to do other strategies, teach you other strategies to replace loss of function in other systems that you may have. This is the best treatment option for bilateral vestibular loss that Dr. Kramer mentioned that is caused by the gentamicin. Um, there's also exercises to increase visual and somatosensory systems. Um, so that is, you know, your vision system and also joint receptors in your legs, your ankles. Um, we can teach you all those exercises. There's also an exercise called the cervico-ocular reflex, which is very similar to the VOR. Um, in case you do not have function in the VOR, this is use, using your um, re joint receptors in your neck to basically do the same movement. And we also go over um, risk factors to prevent falls and go over different strategies for that. So now the biggest one that we really work on and the mo that we see the most is we treat for BPPV, which is the crystals. Um, so this is a canalith repositioning technique most commonly called the Epley Maneuver that we use to treat the posterior and anterior canal of your vestibular system, um, which is the most common. And then also there's different maneuvers to treat the horizontal canal. But basically, if you could see in the picture, oh, here we go. So this is, um, it's very important for us to get this maneuver right. And uh, before we even perform this maneuver, we, we do a Dix-Hallpike test, and we check the right or the left side, and we look for symptoms of the vertigo, the spinning, and also we look for nystagmus, which Dr. Kramer talked about. So then after we find out which side is affected, we do a series of these repositioning movements to help move the crystals back into where they belong. And basically, the way we move the head and the body follows the shape of the canal, and it repositions the crystals back to where they're supposed to be. And basically, we do spend a lot of time doing this maneuver because it can be performed incorrectly. Um, it, ha it has to be very specific. We have to get a lot of movement in the neck in order for it to be done correctly. And we also can teach you how to do this on your own. So if BPPV happens again, and it may, in most patients, you are well equipped with a handout, and we've practiced it several times so that you can treat it on your own, hopefully with a family member, um, and you know not have to go back to the doctor as often. So this is pretty much most of what we do along with different balance exercises. Um, and then, like I said before, there's additional maneuvers that we can also do depending on which canal is affected and how long the vertigo and the nystagmus lasts for. Uh, basically, we can determine this from testing done by the doctor or testing that is done um, for, uh, through the VNG a rotary chair or a VEMP, which actually Elizabeth will talk about. It's a good segue. Um, so there's, I just wanted to let you know, there's other maneuvers out there that I'm not gonna get into detail with, but it could be, other canals could be affected by BPPV. 
And that's it. We have one more speaker, and then you'll be able to ask your questions. Our last speaker is Elizabeth Aspel, audiologist, audiologist in speech, pathology, and audiology department. Elizabeth has a doctorate of audiology from Vanderbilt University and has been at JFK Medical Center for five years. She's part of a team of audiologists that met with neurology twice per week to discuss all balance testing completed in our facility. She believes that multidisciplinary care for patients experiencing dizziness is the key to a successful diagnosis and intervention, and she is very excited to be here this evening. Elizabeth? Hello, all. Thank you for coming out this evening. Okay, so um, I'm an audiologist, which the first question most people say when I say I'm an audiologist is what? And I don't know if they're joking, so I always answer the question. Um, but that means that I diagnose and treat hearing and balance disorders um, for all ages. Uh, this talk specifically is about balance, so the vestibular system. Um, there are a lot of different tests that can be done. I'm going to talk briefly about the major ones, the ones that are most often recommended by neurology. Um, and then there's a lot of other specialty tests, like they suspect Meniere's disease. Maybe you have one of these other tests or something. But by and large, there's a couple tests that often get recommended because they're the best at looking at the system at large, of looking at a lot of different parts of the system in the shortest amount of time, which is the goal. Um, Vestibular testing or balance testing kind of gets a bad rap. I don't know how many of you have either gone through it or known someone who's gone through it, but a lot of times people come in and they say, oh, I'm so anxious, like I heard from a friend that this was going to be terrible, or I read on the internet that this was going to be terrible. 95% of the time, really, people finish the test and they go, oh, that wasn't so bad. Like, I really, I thought that was going to be worse. It was okay. So we really, really try hard to walk you through what we're going to do make you feel better about what we're going to do. And you're always in charge if we're doing something that's too much for you. You can let us know. And then you let Dr. Kramer know. See what he says. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a big deal because more than 40% of people, according to the National Institute of Health, will report feeling dizzy at some point in their life. Um, that's why on a Wednesday evening, even in our community, we got so many faces out here to learn more about dizziness. It's just a big reoccurring thing that if it doesn't happen to you, you probably know someone it has happened to. Um, and then there's, you know, a lot of increased medical risks, cost of health care, risk of falls when you're off balance. So, you know, I don't have to stress it to you because you're here, you're my audience, but it is important to assess and to diagnose. Um, the balance system, and some of this is going to be summary from what was probably already stated, um, but there's a lot of different systems in your body that help control your balance. Your visual system, your somatosensory sense of system, so your sense of touch. So if you have numbness in your, in your feet and toes, obviously balance is going to be more of an issue for you. And then predominantly my role as the in the vestibular system. Um, so some of the 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 main tests that are recommended, this I don't have a slide on, but one of the first tests that's often recommended is a hearing test. And many, many times the first response of my patient is, I don't understand why the doctor ordered this. I'm not here for my hearing. Maybe I have a hearing problem. Maybe I don't have a hearing problem. It's really not the point. It's not why I'm here. So I try to help you understand why the doctor our doctor or some many other referring doctors will recommend a hearing test first. The hearing, the inner ear that controls the part of your hearing is, is millimeters away from the part that controls your balance. So oftentimes, we can see a difference between your ears in your hearing test. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't suspect a problem, or maybe you don't see any difference between your ears. But every once in a while, we say, oh, you know what? In some of these high-pitched tones, your right ear doesn't hear as well as your left ear. And it's the first piece of the puzzle. Like, you've just heard for an hour how complicated this can be in a differential diagnosis and trying to figure out what's going on. So if we find your right ear is worse than your left, that's the first answer to a question we might have not even known we had. Um, so a hearing test is often the first part of your battery of tests. Um, another test that we uh, is probably the most often recommended test is the VNG, or um, video nystagmography. Um, so just to review a little bit of what's been 
told to you already. Nystagmus is the motion of the eyes when it's trying. Typically, it means the brain feels like it's moving and it's trying to maintain focus on something so that you don't feel dizzy anymore. It's a reflex. It's not anything you can control. And sometimes, like, you have a little kid spinning in a chair. It's normal to see nystagmus. Their eyes move or an adult who acts like a little kid. But nystagmus is sometimes normal. It's a normal variant when you, when you evoke it. Um, it shouldn't happen when you're just sitting still. So part of what we test, um, that's the positional testing part, is you're just sitting still or you're laying in different positions and we're watching your eyes. So your, your eyes are the gateway to the soul and the vestibular system. Um, we really want to know, does your brain think you're moving when you're not? Along those lines, does your brain think you're moving more than you're moving when we move you? So we're going to lay you back. We're going to watch your eyes as you lay down. We're going to watch your eyes as you sit up. We look for that BPPV thing, those crystals floating around in your ear that's going to show up in your eye movements. It's another thing that sometimes confuses patients. Like, why are you watching my eyes? I don't have a problem with my eyes. So I'm dizzy. So, you know, first I have to explain the ear part, then the eye part. Um, Caloric testing is the last part of the VNG. That is really the most likely part of the test to make you feel anything. Uh, so what we do is we put some cool air in your ear. We change the temperature in your ear. Changing the temperature in your ear tricks your brain into feeling like you're moving. You usually feel like you're moving for about 30, 60 seconds, and then it typically goes away pretty quickly. Um, so we do that with cool air, we do that with warm air, and comparing the two ears can give us an idea. Is one ear a lot weaker than the other? Is one ear a lot stronger than the other? Um, and this, so this looks at all different parts of the vestibular system, not just the inner ear, but the pathway is going from the inner ear to the eyes, to the, it's back to the brain, to try to give neurology or whoever you're referring physician is, some idea of is there a problem in your vestibular system? And if the answer is yes, can we help narrow down where that problem is? Um, another of the most common tests is called the rotary chair, and that's the one where just the name of it gets people, I don't know about that. Um, really, the rotary chair, it does look very intimidating. It really, because the whole point of it is that nothing's moving except your eyes. So you get in and there's a seat belt and there's a leg thing and there's a head thing and people say, what are you going to do to me? Like, it, it really looks like I'm going to send you to the moon. But really, it's, again, that's the test where everybody gets out of it and they say, okay, it really, it looks bad. I shouldn't have read that article online. Like, it really, like, it's, it was okay. So for most people, most people drive themselves home. Most people are okay. But if you know yourself and you know, I don't think that would be okay for me, bring somebody else to drive you. You know, have a, a backup plan. Um, but for most people, it's okay. And what's nice about this is this doesn't matter if you've got wax blocking your ears. It doesn't matter. This looks at more of those central pathways between your ear and your brain. So we turn the chair in a circle and we watch your eyes. And then we stop the chair and we watch your eyes again. Then we turn the chair the other way. Watch your eyes. Stop the chair. Watch your eyes. And again, comparing does your eyes do the same thing when you move left versus right? Gives us some really, really good clues about where the problem is in your vestibular system. Um, all of these have been touched on already by Dr. Kramer, some of the more common balance abnormalities. Um, even if you go into the office and it's like, oh, you have clear cut BPPV, you have those crystals in your ear, we're gonna send you to physical therapy. Sometimes they send you anyway for more testing. And, and why that is, is because it, it, what we don't want to happen is we don't want, oh, I went to JFK and I, they have the best balance department and I got tested and they said I had BPPV. It turns out I had BPPV and I had a virus that affected my right inner ear. So I went to therapy and they fixed my BPPV, but I still feel dizzy. Like, so we don't want to get part of the answer. We want to really figure out, is that the only thing going on with you? Even bedside when we're able to get an answer for you, there might be more to the story. So that's where we come in to do all these other tests as recommended, most commonly hearing test, VNG, rotary chair. Um, and again, summary of what we've already talked about. What are your treatment options? Okay, so what? You found a problem. What do we do now? Um, vestibular rehab, we'll send you to CAT. Um, medication, we'll send you back to Dr. Kramer. Um, or, and modifications, which are often good for either one of those remedies. So modifications, you know, adequate lighting in your house, getting rid of uneven surfaces, things like that, which um, physical therapy is also a great, great resource for things like that. Like how can I better modify my environment to be safe 
um, in my home and maintain my independence as long as possible, because that's often something that's in the back of people's minds. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions about some of the major audiology portion of testing, and then there's more specific questions about, hey, my doctor wanted a VEMP. What does that mean? I'm happy to field them. Okay, have a great night. So let me get this right. First thing we do is come to see you, get diagnosed, and then you send us to these other people? So or? you'll come in, and the very first person you'll see is Jigna, okay. and she'll get a history, right. um, convey it to me, uh, then I will examine you. She'll do some of the exam. I'll do the exam specifically to the vestibular system. I may ask a few questions, and then um, uh, I may or may not diagnose you. Sometimes I'll diagnose you, and you won't get to, to see Elizabeth because I just know what it is. But sometimes I know what it is, but as she was just saying elegantly, I know what it is, but gee, maybe there's something else, so you'll, you'll see Elizabeth. And very often, as I'm sending you to Elizabeth, I might send you to Cat if that's the appropriate thing, uh, or it may be medication. So when, after you see me, you may see medication and not see either of them, or you may see physical, you may see both of them. It's all very variable, tailored to the person. My question is, could you give me a defin, not definition, a sound maybe of what ringing in the ear is? So what she's asking. I, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So what she's asking about, what we would call tinnitus uh, or ringing in the ears, I do see patients for that uh, as well. We didn't talk about it as much. And what it sounds like, there's actually, if you go on the web, and I can't tell you exactly where, you can hear by talking to people and listening to them, they've actually simulated the sounds that many people have. And some of them are bizarre. Some, the most common one, and I get it occasionally myself, is it sounds like crickets. That, that is the most common form of tinnitus. Um, but it can also sound like bells ringing. It can sound like boards creaking. It can sound like weird space music. Um, it can sound like, it can, <laughs> it can. <laughs> and if you let it go long enough, that's what it sounds like, yep. Um, uh, so it, it is very variable. The one to look out for, though, is when it's pulsing. Psh, 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 psh. And when it does that, take your pulse, and if it's timing for your heart, with your heart, that's really important. Because what you're hearing is most likely a blood vessel or a blood flow of some kind. And 99.999% of the time, no big deal. Some of those times, it's, it's not a big deal, but we can do something. We can fix an artery or a vessel and fix it. But very, I shouldn't say very rarely, occasionally, it's something, it could be an aneurysm you're hearing. So that's really an important thing. The other important type of tinnitus is, is when you hear it in one ear and not the other. Because that can be that, that, our old friend there, that acoustic neuroma can cause it in one ear or not the other. So um, the two really, in, if it's both ears and it's equal and it's not bothering you, then to be honest, it's no big deal. If you want to come in and we can reassure you, that's fine. Um, but if it's really bothering you, then that's something we, we may be able to help you with. We won't make it go away, but we may be able to help you with it. But if it's one ear, or if it's psh, 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 or psh, psh, either of those, those are important to come in for. Just to briefly add to that, ringing in your ears is oftentimes a sign of damage to the nerve in your ear. So we would recommend a hearing test. And if that ringing in your ears is really something that's very bothersome to you. Um, we also do something here in our audiology department called a tinnitus evaluation, where we make recommendations for what are some different like sound generators, what are some different ways that we can help you either therapeutically or with a, with a device to help it so that that is less bothersome to your day-to-day -day life. Because even though it's a very, very common thing, there's a small percentage of the population that it's very debilitating for. Um, so if you're somebody who finds yourself like, I can't sleep at night, this is really interfering with my daily life, uh, there's 
you know, there's often nothing that can be done from a medical perspective, but there's quite a bit that can be done from a, a therapeutic and intervention perspective. So do reach out if you're one of them. Okay. I have a question about the, the crystals. I hear a lot about crystals. What is the etiology and composition of crystals? Are there, is there any place that they would normally be found versus moving into a part of the year? And what would cause that migration? So they are calcium carbonate crystals, if that helps you. They're, they're essentially like little crystallized bone. And um, we use them in our balance system. So the, the most of what we were talking about, the semicircular canals, they sense motions such as this, turning motions in the three different planes. But the linear motion, back and forth, forward and back, up and down, the sense of which, where gravity is in relation to me, that's what the, the crystals are involved with. You can think of them as the, the, um, the Tootsie Pops, you know, the stick with the candy on top. They are the candy on top. They are little weights. And if you, you imagine this, if I were to move the base of this quickly, the weight of this, if this were very heavy, is going to want to stay still. And when that happens, there is stress here at the bottom in my hand, and little nerve endings sense that, and they use that information to sense when I'm moving uh, in a straight line. So that's why they are there. So we need that weight. Because they're little pieces of bone, they can act as pieces of weight, and that's, that's why they they originated there. They sit in a little gel-like surface, and you know we're, we're talking this big, you know, but they sit in a gel-like surface, and they can from time to time fall off. I'm going to say a bad thing here. One of the main reasons they fall off is as we get older. So, so you're more likely to get this as we get older. But I had it 15 years ago, and so. You know, I was in my 40s, and that's because I got hit in a car accident and I got knocked out. So a hard head blow can knock, uh, can knock it out. If you get Meniere's disease and it disrupts um, your inner ear, that can make them fall off. People with migraines, um, any kind of migraines, not particularly vestibular, are three times more likely to get, them, get it than the general public. And people with labyrinthitis, um, are also that that inflammation to the ear can also uh, cause them to knock off. So, you know, here you go, you get Meniere's or you get migraine or you get labyrinthitis and you think you're over it and lo and behold, now you've got the loose crystals. So those are the main reasons we know that they come off, but 50% of the time it's what we call idiopathic. Idiopathic means the doctor's an idiot. Um, <laughs> and and we, don't, we don't know why it happens. We can't find... Uh, the bottom line to it. Did that answer your yes. question? Yes, it did. And I just have one other question. Sure. The pulsatile tinnitus. Yep. Um, what would you do? Would you do an MRI? I would do uh, an MRA, MRA, which is like an MRI. It was, to the patient, it seems exactly like an MRI, but it, um, it looks at the blood vessels. Um, and what I do is I, I will listen to see if I can hear the, the pulsing. If I can, I'll do an MRA. If I can't, I'll do an MRA. If I can't, and the MRA, if I can't hear it and the MRA is negative, I stop there. If I can, if I can hear it and the MRA is negative, then there's enough risk that something's going on. I'll, I'll do an actual arteriogram, uh, you know, where they put a catheter in, in your groin and, 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 and shoot in contrast. There's a little bit of risk of that. But if I can hear it, that means I know something's going on and it's worth the risk. Um, I have a question. I had a labyrinthitis about 30 years ago, 30, 30 years ago. Now, lightheadedness seems to come and it seems to coincide with allergy and cold. Is it connected or... By cold, do you mean cold temperature or cold, cold rhinitis? Cold, and, rhinitis. and then he heaviness uh, inside. So how can I connect those? It may have nothing to do with the labyrinthitis. It may be that, so once you get a labyrinthitis, that ear never recovers. Cat makes it better by adjusting your brain 
to, to adjust to that. But now you've got this, this difference. So when you get some type of illness that can throw off your balance system, it's going to throw off the good side differently than the bad side, and you've got new adjustments to it. Sinusitis, colds, allergies, the book says they don't affect, they don't cause dizziness. They don't cause vertigo anyway. But that's at the first level. Maybe because it affects this and it affects that, and maybe it, you, you get dehydrated because you've got this or something like that, you're not sleeping well, that could trigger a migraine. So on the first order, it doesn't directly affect, but on the second order, it can. Uh, my question is for Katrina. Um, the Epley maneuver that was shown on the screen, the Epley maneuver, mm -hmm. it looked like uh, the shaking of a head, or uh, could you explain it, what the Epley maneuver, or give us a sample? Yes, I mean, I mean we could demonstrate it, Demonst but no, just kidding. Uh, basically what it is, it's not really shaking of the head, but it is, um, so you start off in sitting, and um, I hold the patient's head. Okay. I think we're gonna demonstrate it. Thank you. All right. Do you want me to? Steve, how strong is this table? <laughs> is it going to with? Don't dance on it. Do you want to? Do you want to hold the mic for me? Scoot back a little bit more. Okay. So basically, this is what the patient starts off with, and then we test both sides to make sure that we are treating the correct side. So uh, basically, we'll do the right side first. So we turn the head to the right, and then I support the patient's head, and then we quickly lay back on the count of three. One, two, three. Good. So as you can see, there's a lot of neck extension that needs to happen, and the patient has to keep their eyes open. So from here, if they you know, feel very dizzy, they feel spinning, and it goes away quickly, and it usually does, uh, we also look at the eyes to make sure that there is nystagmus. Then the next position after they feel better is to turn their head the opposite way. And then we wait here for the same amount of time, make sure dizziness goes away. Then after that, um, the patient turns their body the opposite way. So then they turn their body looking down at the floor and then we wait until dizziness goes away. And then the last position is they're gonna sit up. And then we have to be careful. We have to make sure that we're supporting them here because sometimes the crystals, they're getting repositioned and they're gonna fall at this position. And we have to make sure the patient doesn't fall back. So basically that's what it looks like. And we could do it to either side. Depending, depending on which side the ear is affected. Will, will that stop the spinning for the moment? Yes. So you're going to feel vertigo. Um, while your head is in those positions, the most common position is the first one, is you're going to feel intense vertigo. It will go away. And then you should feel better with each position. And when we do it again in the same treatment session, you might feel 50% better and we do it again, you might feel 85% better. So it is very treatable and very successful if that is exactly what you have. Thank you. You're welcome. In reference to what you just did, the maneuver, I was in a car accident two years ago and um, I have three herniated discs in my neck plus a bulging disc and I didn't lose conscious, don't recall hitting my head, but afterwards I have vertigo like you would not believe. <laughs> And um, I wanted to know whether or not, when you, when you do the maneuvers, whether or not mm -hmm. you support the head and all that, because I always have problems with that. Yes, so we definitely make sure we support the head. And it is a little bit uncomfortable because we do have to keep you there, you know, until everything kind of goes away. And most common patient response is they just want to jump back up because, you know, they're spinning, they feel uncomfortable. But, you know, we do support the head. We make sure that you do feel as comfortable as we can make it. We could modify the position too based upon any restrictions that you may have in your neck. Mm -hmm. um, that's also an option. There's kind of different ways of doing it that might not be as stressful on the neck. So we. 
Um, is there any relation between a heartburn and a vertigo? Because most of the times when I heat, I mean, I have a kind of a spicy food, I kind of feel that both the ears are heavy. I can feel the whole thing is spinning at least for a day or so. So I've not seen any literature on that, but I did have one patient who had vertigo. He also had heartburn, and I wasn't helping him with his vertigo, but I sent him to um, Dr. Rosenheck, who hears, who's my GI doctor, and um, he treated him for the heartburn, and the vertigo went away. Oh. And what we postulated was that he was refluxing the stomach acid right, so, much so much that it actually went through the eustachian tube and was um, irritating in his inner ear. I've been looking for a second patient like that so I could have a series and I could oh. publish. <laughs> but, yeah. but, maybe, the second uh, one. Maybe, maybe you're the guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, can, I can finish the puzzle. Thank you very much. We have a question here. Uh, yes, ma'am. I wanted to know if there was any connection between the dizziness and the computer screen monitor. Yeah, with the new flat screens, it's a little bit less so. The older screens um, refreshed um, either at 30 hertz, 50 hertz, or 60 hertz. So essentially, it's flashing before your eyes. I don't think the newer screens, uh, I think they're flashing at 120 hertz. So it's so fast that it doesn't do it. But you might be particularly sensitive. But also, but you know, the other thing is the cell phones and scrolling on the computer that can very much uh, make, bring out dizziness in some people. But looking at a straight screen lately has been less of a problem. Looking, uh, but if you're scrolling around and doing a lot of things on the computer and moving your head around a lot, then I, we do have patients who are computer sensitive. Yes. Is that a connection between wax in the ears and dizziness? Not really. Um, it's important that the wax comes out of the ears so that when we send you to, um, to uh, Elizabeth, that it doesn't interfere with the testing. And the wax can trap bacteria in the ear and, and cause a problem. But it, it is not a form of dizziness. By the way, the reason we tell you not to clean the wax out of your ears is not so much that we're afraid you're going to take that Q-tip and drive it through your eardrum. Most people will feel the pain first and they'll, they'll back off. There's a couple of reasons. If you, notice, if you notice the skin on the back of my hand or the back of your hand when you move it, it moves. If you notice the skin at the tip of your finger and you move it, it doesn't move. Same as the tip of your nose, same as in your inner ear. So when you take that Q-tip and go back and forth, the inner ear isn't moving. So you're really abrading that inner ear. And I've looked in some people's ears and it is just raw uh, when they do that. The other thing is wax is an antibiotic. So it's helping to protect your ears. Now when it builds up too much, that's a problem. And either your primary care doctor and ear doctor can clean it out. Or you can go to the pharmacy and ask, it's called Debrox, but just ask the pharmacist, those drops you put in your ears to get rid of the wax, you put that in your ears, you let it sit there for a while, like five minutes, you do that for three days, it softens it up, and then there's this little squeegee, and they put water in and you squeegee the, the wax out. That's the way to uh, clean out your ears. Um, but wax itself, well, right, and it, it, and tell me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth, it doesn't inter unless it's really packed in, it doesn't interfere with hearing that much. Or do you, you get a difference? No. Yeah. You, um, every once in a while, I just yell. Every once in a while, like if we test you with headphones, because a lot of times if you have a lot of wax, we won't put inserts in your ears because we don't want to push it deeper. So we'll put headphones on you. And sometimes the headphones plus the wax will like collapse your ear closed and make it look like your hearing's a lot worse. But typically the only time wax affects your hearing is when it forms a complete plug. And usually that's from Q-tip use because you pushed some in a little bit at a time. You pushed it deeper and deeper and deeper until it formed an earplug. Me, me next? Yeah, there's sometimes I can tell, uh, one second, there's sometimes I can tell when people use Q-tips because they can essentially see the head of the Q-tip the, the, you know, the impression from it and maybe even a couple of pieces of cotton from it. So Q-tips, bad. I use the head of a big pen. No, no. <laughs> One second. We're just going to do a question. Me? 
All right, I, uh, I've had the Epley maneuver and uh, I've been fine since. Um, but now where do I go from here? Do I just wait to see if it should happen again or do I come in for follow-up? So you're fine now? I have been, yeah. I had it years ago and then I had an episode and I struck my head while on vacation. I hit a pipe and during the night, and mine always occurred during the night in my sleep. I'd open my eyes, the room would be spinning. And that happened about five in the morning in Vienna. I had hit my head on a pipe and I opened my eyes, the room was spinning and I got up for some reason and then I fell right down on the floor. And I had the effects for about two or three days. I was nauseous, I couldn't look up. Um, I came back and then I couldn't even lay down. If I started to lay down a little bit on my left side, I would have to sit back up. Finally, I went for the epile and I've been fine since, but now where do I go from here? Do I do any more? Or? If by fine you mean fine, you're fine. I, I've been yeah. fine, so I don't need for anything. You don't need anything else unless it comes back and then you need treatment. By the way, on this form, sometimes we make our diagnosis by the back of the form, if the first four boxes are checked and nothing else is checked, yeah, I mean, we're not that cavalier to just say it's BPPV, but we're really steered towards that. So that's why this form is, uh, one of the reasons this form is very helpful. But um, yes, you're, you're fine, you're fine, in, unless it comes back, which it can because it comes back 20% of the time. Most of that time is after head trauma if the cause of it is head trauma. So you are a little bit at risk of that happening. I've been suffering from positional vertigo, I thought, years now. However, I have the migraines also that you described. And I also have my ear, one of them. I just wanted to know, are they interconnected or are they three separate things? What, what's, you said your ear, what about your ear? I have loss of hearing there and sometimes I have, a, um, it kind of rings. Okay, or it, so yeah. one way to put that all together would be that you had vestibular migraines which caused the hearing loss in one ear and also put you at increased risk of the uh, crystals. The, another way to put that together is that two different things happened. You had the vestibular migraine, which also caused the crystals to fall off, and you just also happened to have something happen to one ear. Um, so um, I can't say, I, I can make it one thing, uh, and doctors try to make it one thing, because that usually that makes the most sense, rather than you have two things, you have one thing, but, but I wouldn't be definitive about that. If you have a hearing problem in one ear, and you've never had an MRI um, unless, the, unless you had surgery and that's why you lost the hearing in that ear, you need an MRI of your inner ear to make sure you don't have that, that growth. And you don't have to run and get it tomorrow. They grow very, very slowly. But that's something that, uh, that you need to, be, need to have done. So they are connected? So Migraine. I can certainly connect all these things but I don't know they're connected, you know, for just from this little talk, I can't right. tell you that it is, but I, I can create it, I can name a scenario that they're all connected, but without getting a full history and examination and maybe even testing, I can't know for sure. I understand, thank you. Question for Kat, really. Um, I was told, I do the eye exercises, the adaptation, yes. I have the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told, suggested to do it three times a day. It's never gonna happen in my lifetime. <laughs> So is it worth doing it three times a week? <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so you do have to do them at least twice a day because your brain needs that constant repetition in order to adapt. So unfortunately, you know, it does sound like it's a hassle, but if you don't do it with enough frequency, your brain will never adapt to the motions and to improve that VOR reflex that needs to get stronger. Um, so, you know. So the best situation is all this in combination, the habituation, the adaptation, and the substitution for someone who literally topples over. I fell into my fireplace yesterday. I just topple over. So to do one without the other, uh, is not so helpful, right? Yeah, so are you in physical therapy right now? 
Uh, I did. You I, have. You uh, have. Now been. I'm looking at knee repla <laughs> replacement. So we're you know triaging this whole uh, yeah. body. Um, but so I mean, if you have like a lot of exercises that you were given from the therapist, just pick out. Yeah. You know, four to do a day. You don't have to do every single one of them. Yeah. Because that's not realistic. Walk, you know. All that. Yeah, okay, I'm going to get back to it. Like, yeah, that. so just pick a few of them to do every day. Don't go through the whole packet um, and then just vary them. But try to do something every really day. Really twice a day. Otherwise, forget it. Yeah. The, uh, OK, thank you. You're welcome. Have there been any uh, uh, correlation or studies on the relationship between cancer therapies and uh, vertigo or any of the other things we discussed? When I was saying gentamicin, 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 uh, vincristin and vinplatinin um, can cause uh, a vestibular loss. I've never seen it. It should be temporary. Um, it, it should come back. But um, those are the only cancer treatments I know of that cause vestibular loss. Is there any connection between wine and vertigo? <laughs> Let me explain. Occasionally. Is that, is that with an H? <laughs> occasionally. I'll have a glass so, of wine yeah, occasionally, yeah. and I notice that there are some evenings after one glass of wine, I'll roll over that night and have vertigo. It doesn't always happen. So there's a couple of ways. One there's, glass. There's a, there's a couple of things. This friend. So red wine is a trigger from, for in some people for migraine. So it could be red wine is causing migraine. Another trigger is something called um, um, uh, alcohol-induced vertigo. Um, and uh, it's actually PAN. Uh, um, I can't remember the exact uh, word for it, but it's basically due to if you remember that semicircular canal, that little, that little curve thing that tells your brain whether you're turning or not, and the cupula in there, the cupula floats. It is neutrally buoyant. It is the same density as the fluid, the inner ear fluid around it. But um, when you get um, alcohol in your body, alcohol is lighter than water. So when the alcohol comes into your body, since there's blood vessels inside the cupula, the cupula will have alcohol in it and it will begin to float. So it deflects and you begin to feel like you're spinning. After a while though, because the endolymph is treated, it is created by structures that obviously have blood vessels coming to it, alcohol begins to enter into the endolymph. So now the endolymph that the cupula is floating in become, has alcohol in it and it, the cupula becomes neutrally buoyant again. But life is cruel because now the liver starts digesting the alcohol and the cupula start, starts losing the alcohol in the bloodstream and it begins to sink. So you begin to spin in the opposite direction. Eventually the endolymph which is created by a, a vessel, starts losing the alcohol, and now the cupula floats back up to the neutral position, and you stop floating. So you can have, you, that's why you get bed spins when you drink. And they prove this insanely by taking deuterium, which is heavy water, water where the hydrogen has an extra neutron in it. This is, you know, the stuff they make atomic bombs with. <laughs> But it, it, it didn't have any atomic weight in it. They made they mixed they mixed the alcohol with deuterium water, heavy water, so that the density of the alcohol would be the same. The density of this mixture would be the same as water. And they had people drink regular water and alcohol and deuterium and alcohol. And the people with deuterium and alcohol didn't get dizzy. And the people with with um, with uh, the alcohol uh, and water did get dizzy. So if you really want to drink a lot and you don't want to get bed spins, 
you should have deuterium ice cubes. <laughs> They're about $230 a cube. <laughs> but yeah, that's how alcohol can do it. And uh, either, either from the, the density of the alcohol or from the fact that it might be triggering a vestibular migraine in you. Thank you. Do you find that in the history of your patients, that a lot of them that are, have symptoms of vertigo, that they also have had a history of motion sickness? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and those people most likely have vestibular migraine. Um, but it can be something else. Um, but, um, you know, think about it. If your vestibular system is handicapped a little bit, you're not going to handle motion as well. But people with vestibular migraines are very motion sensitive very often. So when I hear that, the first thing I think of is vestibular migraine. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been diagnosed with labyrinthitis, and I also get migraines quite frequently, but I also have lupus. So how would you go about doing some kind of differential diagnosis for my vertigo? So it's possible that your labyrinthitis was caused by your lupus. Um, because labyrinthitis is just an itis, an inflammation of the inner ear. I would expect that to be a recurrent labyrinthitis. So you had the labyrinthitis once, or you're having it recurrently? Um, recurrently. So if you're having it recurrently, then it's, I, I would have to think this out as to whether the recurrent the thing is recurrent migraines or lupus um, acting up with it. There is. Um, there is a test you can do. I haven't ordered it in years. Um, um, a, I call it the 69 Dalton test. If you, take, if you took your inner ear and put it in a blender and then did this thing called plasmapheresis on it, this, a band would come out at 69 kilodaltons. Um, all that means is a certain thing would show up. So if you're disrupting inner ear, then you, we can do this test to your blood. It's just a blood test and it would show that there's a lot of inner ear product in it. And that might make me suspicious that your lupus was acting out on your inner ear. The thing is though, treat your lupus is, is the thing you do for it. And if you're dizzy and, and I can't also treat your migraine, then I might just give you something to help with the dizziness. Those, that, that clonopin, meclizine kind of thing. By the way, I, I hate meclizine. The only, the, only, um, the only good thing, or what, what do I say? The, um, the, only, the most amazing thing about meclizine is when it works. Um, the clonopin works much, much better, but I have to say, except for my wife, um, meclizine works better for her, so it's, it's, not, it's not an all around thing, but um, usually I use clonopin, so I might give you clonopin to try to relax it if I can't treat it in any other way. I would certainly treat the migraine and treat the lupus. And to figure out if lupus was causing your inner ear, I might do that 69 kilodalton test. 